So welcome to tonight's Voyager's Travel Discussion Club. Um, Mike Edding and myself, uh, Susan McBride, are with the Hinsdale Library, and we're glad that you could join us. Tonight's itinerary will begin in Traverse City, Michigan. We will then travel to Columbus, Indiana, the Lexington, Kentucky area, and we're going to wrap our program up in Bayfield, Wisconsin. Our goal for tonight's program was to provide you with four different destinations that are no more than an eight hour drive, closer to a seven hour or less drive from Hinsdale that we hope will inspire you for future travel. So I'm gonna let Mike kick things off tonight in Michigan. Thanks, Susan. Just setting up my sharing here. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. So uh, as Susan mentioned, I'm going to be discussing Traverse City, Michigan. One of my library school classmates grew up there and I remember her telling me how beautiful it was and how outdoor activities played such an important role in the lives of the residents. And with all the coastline, parks, beaches, et cetera, available there, it's not hard to see that why that would be the case. So Traverse City is about five hours from Hinsdale going around the lake. So it's not too bad of, of a drive. You could uh, certainly knock that out in the morning and get there with plenty of time to do some things. One of the most common reasons people travel to Traverse City nowadays is because of the wine, beer, and cider that they have there. Uh, the area is known for having some of the best wineries and craft brewers in the Midwest. So, you know, maybe the best way to experience this beverage bounty is to take a tour, like a wine or beer tour, of the Lelana or Old Mission peninsulas. And those are the two peninsulas uh, of which Traverse City is at the bottom. Um, and there are several tour operators from which to choose. Some of the more popular ones include magicshuttlebus.com, wineandbeertours.com, and uh, Traverse City Tours. So when you do this, basically a tour guide will transport you from place to place via a private um, vehicle or, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a party bus. And these tours tend to, to last about four hours and stop at three or four places along the way. If you prefer hard cider to beer and wine, you're by no means left out though. In town, you might want to stop at the Acoustic Draft Mead Tap Room. It has a guitar theme and is a really relaxed vibe. A little north of Traverse City is uh, Tandem Ciders in Sutton's Bay. And their tasting room opens to the outdoors with picnic tables in a nice wooded setting. So if you've had your fill of adult beverages, you might want to do a little bit of shopping. And a great place to do that is the, the village at Grand Traverse Commons. So this is actually on the site of a former state hospital. And the property has been un undergoing mixed use renovation over the last 20 years or so. Tours of the property are available and they include those uh, that have an underground steam tunnel system as their focus, which dates back to 1883. So you, I think it might be haunted, so you might spot a ghost if you go at the right time. The European style Mercado on the ground floor of the main building features dozens of boutique shops and restaurants and places to drink and that sort of thing. So it would be easy to spend the better part of the day here. If you're looking for a good spot for dinner, Trotteria Stella is a highly regarded restaurant in the complex with an award-winning wine list. So that would be a great place to, to dine. So that would, would cover, I think, the better part of a day, but the next day is uh, a real treat. So if you're a nature lover, uh, you'll want to check out Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. 
It features 400 foot tall dunes and has majestic views of Lake Michigan and Glen Lake. And the color of the water varies from sort of a turquoise to a cobalt blue. In 2011, Good Morning America named Sleeping Bear Dunes the most beautiful place in America over Aspen, Sedona, the Grand Tetons and other nominees. So that's pretty impressive. I'd say a visit here into the surrounding towns would take the better part of a day. One highly recommended way to get a taste of the park is uh, by car. So you simply jump on the Pierce Stocking Scenic Drive in the park, which takes you on a 7.5 mile loop winding through forests and dunes. On the drive, you'll find several designated stopping points along the way. The number nine overlook is probably the best known of these and most popular. It has an elevated wooden platform, which allows you to get picture perfect views of the lake and dunes below. You may be tempted to climb down the dunes to the lake here, but don't. Uh, many people over the years have attempted the two to three hour climb back up and failed, necessitating a rescue, which I think costs about $3,000. So <laughs> instead, they have a designated dune climb in the park, which is less taxing and treacherous. Oh, and if you're wondering, you can't see Wisconsin from the top of the dunes. It's 54 miles away, so a little bit too far. And I'd say probably the best hike in Sleeping Bear Dunes is the Empire Bluff Trail. It's only moderately strenuous and is about one and a half miles long round trip, and you'll be rewarded with one of the best views around. Uh, so Sleeping Bear can get a little bit crowded in the, in the summer. So if this is not necessarily to your liking, you might wanna check out North Bar Lake. This is a, uh, a lake that features temperate water, a family fem friendly atmosphere, shallow areas for young swimmers, and you're sure to enjoy the crystal clear water at North Bar Lake. It's sort of a undiscovered gem of a, of a lake and a beach. So we can't talk about Michigan without at least mentioning cherries. It's one of the largest cherry growing regions in the country, Michigan is. Uh, specifically, they grow tart cherries in Michigan. And they celebrate cherries to the max in Traverse City with a national cherry festival. It's an annual event and it's happening this year from July 3rd through 10th. So if you if you get your act together, you might be able to make it. Um, if you're not coming during cherry, the Cherry Festival to Traverse City, you should at least check out Cherry Republic, which is a themed store uh, that you can see uh, some of their products on the right-hand side of your screen with their cherry salsa. But they have this amazing variety of, of cherry products there, including cherry mustards, cherry pancake mixes, cherry salad dressings, uh, the, the cherry salsa, like I mentioned before. So it's, it's quite an experience. But if, you're, um, if your taste in cherries run a little more traditional, you might want to get a pie instead. And one of the great places to get that is at the Grand Traverse Pie Company. Uh, it's, they're known for getting the very best flavor out of their cherries. And they're original location that actually is in Traverse City on West Front Street. And nowadays the company with all of its locations sells half a million pies per year. And the, their best seller is the Grand Traverse Cherry Crumb Pie, which sounds really good to me. The last thing that I'll discuss about uh, Traverse City and the area around there is Michigan 22 or M22. Um, for a lot of people, this is sort of the highlight of their trip to Michigan is driving on this, this road that winds along the coast of Lake, Lake Michigan and around the shoreline of the Leelanau Peninsula. And the views are really something. So I'll highlight a few of the stops you might wanna make along the way, starting from Manistee Southwest 
of Traverse City and working our way back up to uh, back back to Traverse City. Uh, there's a total of about four hours and 15 minutes of driving time between stops on this route. So you may not want to stop everywhere or you may not want to stay for a long time at any one location, but uh, at least it gives you a place to start. So I'm going to just show you a little map to get your bearings on this. Okay. So if you look at this map, you can see Traverse City kind of in the upper right-hand quadrant and we'll be driving down to Manistee at the very lower left and then up the coastline. And that's where the M22 curves around Lake Michigan and the peninsula. And that, that peninsula that juts out is the Leelanau Peninsula. So going back to the slides. So we'll start out in Manistee and Manistee is notable for its often photographed lighthouse at the end of a concrete breakwater. And as you go through Manistee, you may drive past the Ramsdale Theater where the late actor James Earl Jones got his acting career started. Going up the coastline from Manistee, you'll, you'll check out the Arcadia Scenic Turnout uh, or the Arcadia Overlook. Sometimes they even call it Inspiration Point. And uh, you can get great views of Lake Michigan from, from this spot, which is right along M22. Going further up the coast, you'll come to the town of Frankfurt. And like Manistee, Frankfurt has a lighthouse situated at the end of a breakwater. And uh, there's another lighthouse in the area too, though. If you go along the coast north of Frankfurt, you'll find the Port Betsy Lighthouse. And this historic lighthouse was completed in 1858 and has a dwelling attached to it. It was the last lighthouse on Lake Michigan to become fully automated. And as of July 1st, you'll be able to tour the lighthouse on weekends and climb its tower again. It's been closed due to COVID since 2020. Our next stop is Glen Arbor. This is north of Frankfurt. And as you go north of Frankfurt, you'll also pass Sleeping Bear Dunes. So we've already talked about that. I won't go into any more detail here. So once you get past Sleeping Bear Dunes into Glen Arbor, you'll notice that there's a Cherry Republic store here too. And this is actually their headquarters. So if you didn't have a chance to check it out in Traverse City, you can do so there. Um, there's a sign on the store that says, this business is run by simpletons. Selling, one, selling more than one fruit would be too complicated. So I, I appreciate their self-deprecating humor there. Um, another popular activity you might wanna do in Glen Arbor is kayaking. There's the Crystal River that winds through Glen Arbor and this narrow river, uh, the water's perfectly clear and calm and it makes for a very relaxing afternoon. Contact Crystal River Outfitters if you're interested in, in renting a kayak or two. And uh, the next stop on our tour of the peninsula on M22 is Leland. And this is a community of about 400 residents. And it's one of the more quaint villages on the Leelanau Peninsula. It used to be the county seat and was a bustling commercial hub, but now tourism in the summer is a big draw for them. There's a really quaint sort of waterfront area that's um, a lot of fun and not too big, so it wouldn't take you long to explore the whole thing. And that's known as Fishtown. And after Leland, we'll take a little detour off of M22 to our northmost stop on, on this tour, which is called Northport. And in Northport is Leelanau State Park. It has about eight and a half uh, miles of hiking trails, dunes, and beaches, but the state park is maybe most notable as the home for the Grand Traverse Lighthouse, which was completed in 1858 also. The, the lighthouse springs from the top of the Red Roof building and provides an impressive view. And the museum and tower are open for visits now uh, after a COVID-related closure. And our last stop 
on this grand tour of the M22, or as they would say, M22, there's no the, um, is Sutton's Bay. It has a very nice walkable downtown with these brightly painted buildings. You can see the downtown in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. You can stop by one of the art galleries uh, that um, are from local artists or maybe pick up some cheese at the Lelana Cheese Company. If you're still feeling energized after your, your tour around the peninsula, you could go to Grand Traverse Bike Tours to rent a bike or even book a little bike tour. So this brings our M22 visit to a close and as well as our Traverse City destination. I think you find um, a lot of natural beauty and great shopping, delicious food and drink in this area of Michigan. Are there any questions about Traverse City? Okay, I'm gonna move on then to the next destination, which is, as Susan mentioned, Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana, if you don't know, is uh, well known for having an amazing collection of architecture by big names in the architecture field. It only has about 48,000 people, so you'd be surprised to find exactly what riches await you there. This is chiefly due to the Cummins Company, uh, maker of engines and other industrial products. They wanted to help Columbus attract the best and the brightest. So they created a foundation in 1954 to help support architecture in the area. Under the terms of the program, the foundation would agree to pay the design fees for a public building if the, the people that wanted the building would choose from a list of architects that were generated by the foundation. It takes a little over four hours to get there from Hinsdale, but I suggest making a little pit stop in Indianapolis for a distinctly Midwestern dish, the breaded pork tenderloin sandwich. So Columbus, again, is a little less than four hours. You can see it's a pretty much a straight shot down from Hinsdale through Indianapolis. So the, <laughs> the breaded pork tenderloin sandwich, if you're unfamiliar with it, is basically a, a pork loin that's been pounded very flat and thin. And then it's put on a bun with uh, onions and lettuce and sometimes pickles and mayo or, or uh, mustard. But it's, it's mainly known, I think, for having the, the meats be much larger than the bun, which makes it kind of comical to eat. Um, some people have different strategies for dealing with this. They'll, um, they'll cut around the sandwich so it's just the bun and the sandwich, and then they have the extra meat they can take home for leftovers. Some people cut the actual tenderloin in half and stack it so they have a double decker. Uh, and some people just, you know, go whole hog and, and eat, the, <laughs> eat the thing as it is. But at any rate, you, um, you probably want to skip breakfast if you're going to grab lunch in, in Indianapolis. I suggest going to Grindstone Charlie's in Indianapolis. And it's on the west side of, of town. So it, it's right along the way to Columbus. So getting into Columbus itself, the first stop I wanted to mention is the is a public library. I first learned about Columbus when I heard there was a public library there designed by I.M. Pei, who is perhaps best known for his glass pyramid in the center of the Louvre courtyard. Um, he also did the East Building of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., very distinguished artist. So a fellow library school student and I decided to make the trip from Champaign to pay homage to this, this famous library. And when you enter it, uh, you'll immediately notice the distinct coffered ceiling uh, that, that has a really cool pattern as you look at it um, through the, the image here. And outside the library, you'll find a Henry Moore sculpture entitled Large Arch. I doubt many public libraries 
and their squares feature this kind of pedigree. Aside from public libraries, you could also find some really distinctive churches. The first one I'll talk about is, is one of my favorites. It's the North Christian Church. It was designed by Aero Saarinen and constructed between 1959 and 1964. You may know Saarinen from his design for the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, or maybe his design for the soaring TWA, former TWA uh, terminal at JFK International in New York City. This was the last building that Saarinen designed and he thought it was among his greatest works. And the grounds of the church are really special too. They were designed by a noted landscape architect known, known as Dan Kiley. I like the St. Peter's Lutheran Church by Gunnar Burkertz, a Latvian American architect also. He's notable for his Latvian National Library and uh, the Corning Museum of Glass in New York State. This church was completed in 1988, so it's more recent and has a grand spire as well. Moving on, uh, fire stations are also kind of a big deal in Columbus, if you can believe that. Probably the most famous fire station in Columbus is fire station number four by Robert Venturi. But my personal favorite is this historic fire station number one in the Art Deco style. It was designed by Leighton Bowers in 1941. So at some point, after walking around and checking out this architecture, you're probably going to be hungry for a treat. I'd say a good place to get that is uh, this historic ice cream parlor named Zaharako's. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so sorry. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the, the five quintessential ice cream shops in Indiana, according to Indianapolis Monthly. So you might try a big Z Sunday with five scoops of ice cream, or maybe go old school with a Green River ice cream float. Uh, but at any rate, uh, if you have any young people with you, they're sure to enjoy uh, ice cream here. So after the, the architecture, um, you're probably interested in something a little more natural and less man-made. Brown County State Park is a good antidote to all the, the architecture sightseeing. It's about 20 miles due west of Columbus near Nashville, Illinois, and it offers um, 16,000 acres with historic buildings made by the Civilian Conservation Corps. When you visit, you'll find rolling hills and beautiful overlooks. It has some great mountain biking, hiking, and horse trails as well. Some have called it the Little Smokies because of its steep hills and foggy ravines. Many people visit Brown County State Park during the autumn when the fall colors make it particularly beautiful. If you're interested in a higher vantage point, check out the Lily Lookout, which is a 75 foot tall former fire tower donated by the Lilly family of Eli Lilly pharmaceutical fame. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at Columbus, Indiana. It seems like a great place for a weekend road trip. And uh, I'll turn the next part of our presentation over to Susan, who will talk about Kentucky. Thanks, Mike. Um, let's let me advance my slide. So I am going to talk about a couple of destinations that are in the Lexington, Kentucky area. And um, I'm kind of centering it around Natural Bridge, which is a state park in Kentucky. Um, but we'll be hitting a few other destinations on our way. To get to Natural Bridge, um, you're gonna drive uh, by way of Indianapolis, then Louisville to Lexington, and it's just a little bit further from Lexington. It's about a six, six and a quarter hour trip from Hinsdale. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Natural Bridge, then we're gonna move on to Lexington and talk about the Keeneland Horse Track and um, Fort Herod State Park, and then the Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill. So Natural Bridge is located in the Red River Gorge area of Ken Eastern Kentucky. And this is an area that has been shaped over millions of years by the Red River, cutting these really impressive rock formations. It's very similar to how the Colorado River had shaped the Grand Canyon. Just in the vicinity of Natural Bridge State Park are over 200 of these natural stone arches, um, along with cliffs and caves and gorges. It's a very beautiful area. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's well worth a trip. Um, and then it's located within the Daniel Boone National Forest, which is about 29,000 square miles. So it's a really large area. So an interesting way to enter the Red River Gorge area is through this 900 foot tunnel. It's the Nada Tunnel. And it's located along Kentucky, like Route Kentucky 77, which is part of the Red River Gorge Scenic Byway, which is a, it's a 46 mile stretch of road that kind of winds through the mountains and, and the gorges. And it's, it's um, there are a lot of um, rock sides that have been maybe blast, blasted through to get your drive, to be able to drive through it. Um, and it's a very beautiful landscape and um, lovely drive. So what's interesting about this tunnel, it was originally built for logging railroad use during the early 1900s, um, but it is a one-way tunnel. I think you can see in the picture, there's a car coming through it and only one car will fit. So you're on a two-lane road and you have to get through this one lane tunnel. So it's a little thrilling. You have to stop and see if there are any headlights coming towards you and then and then drive through it. And it, it's a very pretty um, tunnel and um, just a kind of fun, a fun thing to do if you haven't done something like that. Um, and it's rumored to be haunted. So perhaps you'll see some interesting glowing lights or something as you drive through it. I've been through it a couple of times and I've never seen any signs of hauntings, but you'll never know. Maybe you'll see. So the reason to come to Natural Bridge State Park is to immerse yourself in nature. So for this reason, I really recommend staying at um, on the grounds of the state park. There's a lodge called the Hemlock Lodge. Um, you know, it's maybe a 1950s style um, hotel, but every room has a private balcony that is overlooking this beautiful mountainous countryside. Um, and it's a great starting off point for your hikes. They're right at the trailheads. There are also some little cabins right around the Hemlock Lodge that you could stay in as well that have like kitchenettes if you prefer to do some of your own food prep. Um, but, and, and the Hemlock Lodge has a fun little restaurant inside of it too. So the park has nine different hiking trails and they range from just under a mile to about nine and a half miles long. They also range in difficulty. Some of them are a little more difficult of a hike because there is quite a bit of elevation change. Um, but um, all of the trails are beautiful and worth hiking. The highlight for sure is the hike to Natural Bridge. You can see it here in this picture. It is a 65 foot high sandstone arch that spans, um, it's about a 78 foot wide gorge. So to get to Natural Bridge, you can either hike to it by way of several hiking trails, or you can take this sky lift up to the top, which is a ski lift type. Um, I mean, it's very similar to a ski lift with the bar that comes down. Um, when I was there, and actually there may not be a bar still, when I was there, there was no bar that went in front of you. You literally sat on the sky lift and dangled your feet. And it was, um, it was very thrilling um, and a great way to get to the top. Um, but if you wanna hike, I recommend taking the Balanced Rock Trail. 
It is the steepest trail in the park and you can see it pictured here. There are over 600 stairs that you have to climb up at one point. Um, and along this trail, you're going to um, pass by the balanced rock formation here, which is a large sandstone, a really large sandstone boulder. The picture doesn't really do it just, justice. Um, it's precariously balancing on top of another one. It's been like this since I was a kid. So it's, I don't think it's gonna fall, but it's, um, it's a really fun little um, formation to walk by. You're also gonna have to pass through this very narrow passageway that some people have to actually turn sideways to get through. Uh, when you reach the top of the bridge though, it's gonna be worth it because you will have amazing 365 degree views of the mountains in the distance. Um, there are no safety railings at the top and people will sit on the edge and dangle their feet, which gives me the willies. Um, other people will lay on their stomachs and kind of peer over the edge with their camera to get pictures. Um, you're perfectly fine just doing what I did, which is walk right down the middle <laughs> without, <laughs> without um, being too close to the edge on either side. Um, and nobody will look at you side-eyed if you do that. From the top of Natural Bridge then, um, if you follow the Laurel Ridge Trail, it's a pretty easy walk and you're gonna walk around the rims of some of the cliffs. The trail goes past the sky lift and then it winds out to a ridge, um, a, a, along a ridge to lookout point, which you can easily see from when you're on Natural Bridge. If you continue on the trail, you're gonna end up right here on this left-hand picture um, at a uh, it, it dead end there. Uh, this is called Lover's Leap um, and it has a commanding view of the canyon. It's really stunning. And um, the left side here or the right side is, is the view that you'll have from Lover's Leap. If you enjoy hiking, I would plan to spend two days at Natural Bridge before going on to explore more Kentucky. Um, it, there's plenty to see, and it's really um, an under-publicized, beautiful, natural area to, to explore. But we will move on now. We're going to head up to Lexington, Kentucky, which is a little more than an hour's drive from Natural Bridge. It's the second stop on our Kentucky trip, and this is Keeneland Racetrack in Lexington, Kentucky. Now, you probably have heard of Churchill Downs. It's the most well-known track in the country, but it owes much of its success to Keeneland because Keeneland was originally conceived to, to serve as a monument to the sports heritage and the tradition. And it's really um, where the heart of horse racing in Kentucky um, began. You will want to start your day early when you visit Keeneland. Um, as you'll see in this picture in the lower right hand corner, um, you can watch the early morning practice uh, where the horses and their um, trainers are out practicing on the track before the racetrack opens for, for races. You can then take a self-guided tour of the grounds before the race um, and that's they're less crowded then, which is a great time to do your touring of the grounds. The morning workouts are really great because practically no one goes to them. And you can get so close that you can hear the trainers talking, you can hear the horses snorting, and you really, it's a very intimate setting. It's a great way to get up close and personal to these um, really amazing horses. After the morning workout, I highly recommend heading to the Trap Kitchen restaurant. The food is cafeteria style and it's fine, but it's not anything special. You don't go there for the food. You go there because you have the chance to have a meal alongside the owners, the trainers, the exercisers, and the jockeys, because that's where they all go to eat. Uh, and, and the short drive to the restaurant's worth it because you drive through the barn area they actually have a crossing guard that stops traffic to allow the horses to cross the street. It's a great way to see the behind the scenes activity of this famous horse track. Another fun thing to do while you're visiting here, if you're gonna see the races, is to um, 
view the horses and the jockeys at the paddock um, right here before the race. You can see up close what each horse's temperament is that day. There's 30 minutes between each race, which gives you time to go down to the paddock before watching the race. So it makes it a little, again, more interesting and um, gives you a little context when you actually watch the race. And while you're at the paddock, you'll want to look for these statues of the jockeys. Uh, you'll notice that they're all painted different colors. Each year, they are repainted to display the winning colors of the silks of all of the grade races. Um, so they change every year. And, and then if you happen to be there in the fall, you can observe the September sale. And this is the premier thoroughbred auction house in the world. So for reference in 2019, Keeneland cataloged over 4,500 horses to be sold in just 13 days. So it's, it's, it's a very busy auction house. Um, and there have been more grade one, group one, which is the highest level champions um, go through the Keeneland sales arena than any other in North America. So if you do decide to go to Keeneland um, in Lexington, I would, uh, plan to spend about a day or a full day there before heading out to our next destination, which is Old Fort Herod State Park. And it's about a 40 minute drive from Lexington and Keeneland in, um, in Harrodsburg. I moved this, I think. Is that better? Um, here you can become immersed in a full-scale replica of the fort that was built by James Herod in 1774. Now, uh, the fort wasn't a military fort. It wasn't a military installation. It was built by the residents to protect themselves from the indigenous people early on, and then later on uh, during the Revolutionary War from the British. The site is a living history museum. So, as you walk around the grounds, you, you can enter the cabins and the block houses, and they're gonna be furnished with the handmade utensils and the furniture, the tools and implements that were used by the pioneers. There will be costumed craftspeople in each area that are reenacting their, the pioneer tasks, um, like the woodworking and the weaving and the basket making, blacksmithing. They're gonna be tending the farm animals and the gardens, and so you'll kind of get a feel for what life was like back then. You can also tour the Lincoln Marriage Temple. And this is the original log camp cabin where Abraham Lincoln's parents were married in 1806. Um, there's also a um, museum, the Mansion Museum, and there you will find Civil War artifacts, um, including a gun display and some Native American artifacts as well as a collection of Lincoln memorabilia. You'll probably wanna plan about a half a day visit to Old Fort Herod State Park, unless you're really into this type of history and then maybe a little bit longer. And then just down the road, about 10 minutes back towards uh, Lexington is our final stop on our Kentucky tour. And this is the Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill. The Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill was home to the third largest Shaker community in the United States um, in the like 1805 to 1910 range. Um, going to this Shaker Village is kind of a, it, it, it'll give you a window into what life and was like for the Shakers. And if you're not familiar with them, the Shakers were a religious society um, that were known for, um, the way that they kind of danced, it was shaky and, um, uh, and that's how they got their name, the Shakers. It was, you know, the, they were moved by the spirit and that's what caused them to dance in the shaky fashion. Um, but they were also progressive and industrial and they were very well known for their craftsmanship. So as a result, the buildings and their village were meticulously constructed and maintained. Um, their workshops were world, really world renowned for reliable goods, and they had very ample gardens as well. 
Um, the Shakers invented hundreds of labor-saving devices. Um, they invented the clothespin, they invented the circular saw. Um, a lot of their inventions, all of their inventions, they shared to anyone who wanted them without any patents. And, and other people then went on to get the patents and had brilliant careers launched and the Shakers really lost out on that. Um, but that's, I guess, that's, they, that wasn't what they wanted. Um, when visiting the Shaker village, you will learn about their public water system, which was one of the earliest west of the Alleghenies. The Shakers er um, erected a pump house at a spring very near their village. And they had a horse that was hitched up to a wheel that would walk around um, in a circle and propel the water to their water house where it was stored in a 19,000 gallon, 19,000 um, gallon reservoir on the second floor of the water house. From there, gravity would feed the water um, that was clean, natural spring water to the kitchens and to the family dwellings. And it was such a successful public water system that they avoided completely um, a severe cholera outbreak that uh, occurred in the 1800s. So you can tour the water house, you can see the large cistern, um, and you can tour the adjacent bathhouse where they took baths. Um, those are just two of the 34 remaining buildings that you can tour. There were originally 300 on part of this, as part of this village. The kind of cool thing about Shaker Village is that in addition to touring the buildings, and seeing what a slice of life was like, you can actually stay there. You can, um, they have 72 guest rooms in about 13 of the historic buildings that you can stay in um, to, to get a sense of what life was like there. And overnight visitors get the opportunity to participate in what they call rise and shine at the farm. And that includes uh, breakfast time for the farm animals, and then different programs throughout the day that focus on different aspects of the agricultural and farm life of the village. Um, so like I mentioned, they, the Shakers were really well known for their craftsmanship and they built fine buildings and, and um, fine um, furniture. And if you really appreciate this meticulous craftsmanship and ingenuity, you will truly enjoy a day at Shaker Village to wrap up your visit to Kentucky. And I'm going to move on to my second destination, which is the end of our um, tour of the Midwest. And this is Bayfield, Wisconsin. So Bayfield, Wisconsin is a quaint, quaint town situated on the shores of Lake Superior. It's in an area known as the Sh um, Shequamagon Bay. And that derives its name from the Ojibwe word for shallow water. Bayfield is a little over seven hours from Hinsdale by way of Madison, Wisconsin. And when you're visiting Bayfield, you're also going to want to take a ferry to Madeline Island, which is the largest of the Apostle Islands. And you'll also want to visit some of the other smaller Apostle Islands, um, either by boat or by kayak and we'll get into that. You can see it's up here on a little point. Um, it's pretty near Duluth, Minnesota, actually. It's not far. So Bayfield itself grew up as a fishing and logging town, but it's now a really great destination for a long weekend getaway. The town of Bayfield has cute shops and restaurants and coffee houses and um, you can wander and walk your way uh, around the town and wander into the shops um, when you first get there. Part of the experience of visiting Bayfield is staying in one of the old historic homes that have been converted into these quaint inns. Um, this is the Rinton House Inn. It has an expansive wraparound porch that gives you beautiful views of Lake Superior. And um, there are 20 rooms in the inn, and most of them you can see Lake Superior from your window. 
it also has it houses the, probably the finest um, restaurant in Bayfield, um, the fanciest restaurant, the, the name of which is the Landmark. And so you probably will want to try to have a meal there while you're staying at the Rittenhouse Inn. Uh, there are a couple of must do's when you're visiting Bayfield. The first is you're gonna wanna walk down the street. You can see the lake in the distance and just to the side is the Bayfield Inn. And you're gonna wanna make sure to have drinks and perhaps stay for dinner on the rooftop deck of the Bayfield Inn. They have bright blue umbrellas and they are right on the water overlooking the lake. And it's one of the best views in the town. Second, if it's summer when you visit, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to find out what is playing at the outdoor venue, um, the uh, big, big Top Chautauqua. So Big Top Chautauqua is literally a, a big tent that has live entertainment throughout the summer and early fall. They have everything from Garrison Keeler to live bands. Um, so something there for everyone. And um, you know, if there's something that's showing when you're there that strikes your fancy, it's a really fun evening. The third thing you're gonna wanna do is just outside of Bayfield, and that is to visit the Houghton Fall Natural Area. This is um, a pre-Cambrian sandstone gorge that is right along the Lake Superior shore. They have an easy one and a half mile hike. It's not at all challenging, but you will be surrounded by Canadian yews and hemlocks and cedars and birch alongside these sculpted sandstone, sandstone gorges. So it's gonna give you this cross between the Pacific Northwest and and a backdrop of like a fantasy movie because it almost feels unreal. Bayfield makes a great home base then after you've done your exploring of the town to branch out and see some other things. So the first thing you may wanna do is to visit some of the fruit farms. Uh, during the summer and fall months, um, these fruit farms are nonstop. Um, this is because Bayfield is their, uh, Bayfield's location near Lake Superior and the Apostle Islands creates this unique microclimate that really allows fruits and berries to flourish. So there are fresh strawberries, there are sweet and tart cherries, there's raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. And they can all be purchased at the farmer's market in downtown Bayfield um, on Saturday mornings. But you might also want to um, check out the roadside stands along what they call the fruit loop, which is a circuit of 16 fruit farms that and orchards and wineries that are right in the out, outskirts of Bayfield. And as the temperature cools um, at the end of the summer, um, the berries are no longer producing, but the apple orchards begin their harvest. So you can either get berries or if you're a little later, you can get apples. The berry farms and the orchards also offer um, pick your own options as well as picking them up at the farmer's market. Every autumn, the growing season culminates with a three-day celebration. I think this is reminiscent of the, the Traverse City Cherry Festival. Um, in Bayfield, they have an apple festival and it's uh, known locally as Apple Fest. And they have a lot of local foods and arts and craft foods and lots of great apple um, treats um, and entertainment too. And, um, a lot of it takes place at that big top chautauqua tent. So this year's Apple Fest will be held October 1st through the 3rd. So mark your calendars. It might be a good time to visit. After a day of exploring Bayfield and the surrounding Fruit Loop, you will be ready to leave the mainland and to head out to the islands. So the first stop is going to be Madeline Island. Madeline Island is the largest of the Apostle Islands. It's about 15 miles long and 13 miles wide. It is about two and a half miles from Bayfield and it's reachable by ferry. Um, 
you can put your car on the ferry if you want, or you can just ride on the ferry yourself. It's the only of the Apostle Islands that allows commercial development and private ownership. So there is a permanent uh, population of about 250 residents who live on the island. Um, even though you can take your car on the ferry, probably um, the better option is to leave it on the mainland. And when you get to Madeline Island, you can rent bikes or scooters. Given it's a relatively small island and there's not a lot to drive around and see, um, it's probably worth it to save your money and to have fun on the bikes and scooters. The ferry will leave you at the village of La Pointe. It's only a few blocks and there are cafes and shops on either side of the dock. There's a museum, there's an art center, and then there's two small motels. There are a couple of restaurants you might wanna check out, but Cafe Seche is a farm to table restaurant. It has a very interesting menu. It's very highly regarded. So that may be one of your first stops when you get to Madeline Island. Another stop might be Tom's Burn Down Cafe. Uh, as the name implies, it is what it remained and then sprouted back up after they had a fire in the 90s. So um, the story is um, the story is pretty tall and has been um, probably enhanced over the years. But um, as legend has it, this haphazard makeup of Tom's um, lends credence to the idea that Tom took what was left of his burned down bar, pulled up a trailer and started serving beer. And then what has emerged is this mostly open air collection of decks and bars that draws local people and tourists. And it, it creates this pretty cool atmosphere with um, a pretty laid back vibe. There are um, kind of philosophical things that have been written on the walls and it's, it's, it's pretty, a pretty unique spot. So you may wanna check that out when you're on Madeline Island. You will also wanna make your way to the Big Bay State Park where they have this long crescent shaped beach that faces out of the island at, to nothing but Lake Superior. And the lake is this really deep blue, beautiful lake. It, it almost looks like, um, like the Caribbean, but it's not. It's Lake Superior, which is the largest lake in the world and it's super deep. And so it typically doesn't get much above 45 degrees. So you're not really gonna swim in it. Swimmers will dash in and they'll dash out of the water, but they, they, won't, they won't stay in it for very long. So don't be tricked. Um, another interesting thing to note is that in the winter, they create um, the, the lake between Madeline Island and Bayfield will freeze completely. Um, and they create a road. So you can, um, the residents are able to leave the island once the ice comes and they're not stuck. And they will line the road with Christmas trees to kind of mark the path and they'll plow it. But there's um, actually a, a, an ice road that will um, connect Madeline Island to the mainland when the ice is thick enough. So Madeline Island is the largest of the Apostle Islands, but there are 21 other islands that make up the Apostle Islands. And the Apostle Island National Lake Shore um, is um, on the mainland, um, kind of looking out over these islands. And so one way to explore this area is by taking an island cruise. And there are several different companies that run these cruises. They can range from two and a half to three hours to an all day event. Um, and some will even um, be overnight events that will take you to these islands to camp. Touring um, the Apostle Islands will allow you to see these amazing um, caves that have been sculpted um, along the shoreline of the islands and the mainland. Um, and another great way to see them and really get up close and personal, uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner here, is to go kayaking. So centuries of this wave action and the freezing and the thawing 
have sculpted these caves and these inlets um, that are just really gorgeous. If you do decide to go kayaking to see them more closely, you're gonna to wanna to set up a professionally guided tour. Um, and there are many licensed tour companies that can do this. Um, some of them even include a motorized boat escort so that if you need bathroom facilities, for example, or food and drink, then, or if you just need to stop kayaking, you can um, get onto a, a boat and not have to stay in the kayak all day long. Uh, the day long tours are about five and a half hours long with active kayaking being about two of that time, two hours of that time. And then the half day tours are, are about two hours long. And some of the tours will include lunch. Some of them will include stopping at some of the islands. Um, all of them will include an experience you really probably won't forget. So finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention the sailing culture of Bayfield. There's a very big sailing culture there. And if you're a sailing enthusiast or you just appreciate really beautiful sailboats, Bayfield is a really great destination for you. There are many fine sailboats that are moored in Bayfield. And it's fun to just wander through the docks. And if you enjoy sailboats, then you will appreciate looking at these really beautiful boats. You can actually sail from Bayfield to the Atlantic Ocean by way of the St. Lawrence River. It's a trip that would take you at least nine days under perfect conditions, probably more. Um, probably most people won't have the opportunity to take that trip, but you can charter a sailing trip from Bayfield out onto Lake Superior for a half a day or a whole day, and it can be truly exhilarating. Like I said, Lake Superior is the largest lake in the world and experiencing it on board a sailboat can be exciting. Um, but you wanna make sure that you are in good hands and that you um, are working with an experienced sailor. So um, I, I went out on a sailboat from Bayfield um, on Lake Superior I was on a 40 foot sailboat and I will never forget it. It was a, we sailed to Madeline Island and it was such a rigorous sail that we ended up taking the ferry back to Bayfield. So it's, it can be treacherous, but it's really, really beautiful. And it's a great way to see the shores of Wisconsin as well as just enjoy the water. So that wraps up Wisconsin. And that wraps up our program. Hopefully you have um, picked up a few ideas along the way of different destinations you might want to check out. Uh, Mike and I are also available to answer any questions that you might have. I have a question. Um, could you please repeat the name of the park, I think it was, that has the sandstone gorge near Bayfield? Um, yes, that's Houghton, um, Houghton Falls. Houghton Falls. H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Susan and Mike, do you have, normally you have a handout for all these uh, travel places, right? Would you happen to have a handout for this? Yeah, we are going to, um, we are going to, send you a copy of the slides as well as a link to our program evaluation. I'll, I'll do that in the morning. Oh, okay, um, no problem. Yeah, and then it will be, um, I, we had a question about whether it's recorded. It will be posted on our website. I can, um, I'll include a link to where our recorded programs are. Um, it's not posted right away, but I would say sometime within the next week, it will be posted on our recorded programs site. Great, thank you. We always leave those things in the car, so that last minute. <laughs> oh, oh, that's yeah. good. Good. Yeah. Especially the the cheap eats and all those. <laughs> <laughs> it's always sitting in the back seat of the car. <laughs> Perfect. I'll make sure to send out a um, PDF of the slides. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. So it's good information. Any other questions? 
Has anybody been to any of the locations that we discussed tonight that have anything to add? Okay. Chandler and I have been to the Kentucky, Lexington area, the covered bridge and all that. Oh, good. Yeah. We spent a couple of days there. It was really good. It's very pretty there. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you don't realize there's that much beauty this close to Illinois. <laughs> yeah. I have been to Brown County State Park. Oh. And it was beautiful, great trails. It was about 40 years ago, so my memory fails me. <laughs> was, <laughs> there was a place to stay in the park. We stayed in a lodge oh, that yeah. was open to the public in the park, and it was quite pleasant. Good. Yeah, were you there at uh, in the summer or in the fall? Um, it was actually on the way to the Kentucky Derby. So oh, it was... Okay you know, late April. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, hopefully everyone got some great ideas and um, we'll be eager to hear if um, any of you are end up taking any of these trips. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, spending the evening with us and uh, we always appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Have a great night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys.